Chapter 21 of The Cruise of the Alert in Search of Treasure by E. F. Knight. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 21 We Abandon the Search. The five men I had left on the island had certainly done their work well. The doctor had made an excellent leader and had organized all the operations capitally. They had toiled hard and had kept up their spirits all the while and what is really wonderful under circumstances so calculated to try the temper and wear out patience they had got on exceedingly well with each other and there had been no quarrelling or ill-feeling of any sort the ravine had been very thoroughly explored and we felt that there was but little chance of our finding the treasure it was highly improbable that the massive golden candlesticks of the Cathedral of Lima would ornament our homes in England. It was decided, however, that, if the weather permitted, we should stay here another three weeks or so, and, as we were satisfied that the treasure could not be at the first bend of the ravine, that we should dig in such other spots as appeared suitable hiding places, and would be naturally selected for the purpose by a party of men landing in this bay. The shore party were glad of a holiday on the yacht, after all their labors and privations, and no attempt was made to take the whaleboat through the surf again that day. All hands stayed on board for the night, and on the following morning, as the sea was still breaking too heavily on the beach of Southwest Bay to permit of a landing, I proposed to my companions that we should take another holiday and go for a picnic on the water. The cook was, therefore, instructed to prepare an especially good dinner, and after shaking the reefs out of our mainsail, we proceeded to circumnavigate the island, keeping as close to the shore as we were able so that we could have a good view of the scenery. We sailed by the different points which we now knew so well, the Ness, the Pier, the Nine Pin, and at last doubled North Point. This extremity of the island is extremely wild and desolate and is utterly inaccessible. Many of the sharp pinnacles which cap the mountains are out of the perpendicular and lean threateningly over the sea. I have already explained that the different species of birds occupy different portions of the island. The crags by North Point are inhabited by the frigate birds and sea hawks. We coasted along the weather side of the island, and when we were nearly opposite to the Portuguese settlement, the wind dropped, and we had to man the whaleboat and tow the yacht seaward, for we found that she was gradually sagging before the swell towards the reefs on which the sea was breaking heavily. We could not get round the island, so sailed back before a very light wind to southwest bay, and hove to as usual for the night. Work was resumed the next day, and a boatload of stores was sent on shore. The newly formed sandbank, which I have mentioned, appeared to increase and become a more serious obstacle to landing every day. On this occasion, the boat again drove her stem into the sand as she crossed this shoal, and the next wave swamped and capsized her, so that boat, men, and stores were tumbling about in the deep water between the sandbank and the shore. They managed to haul the boat safely up, and by diving in the surf, recovered a good many of the tins of food. Then the boat returned to the yacht, Joe being left alone in the camp. He did not relish this at all, for like most black men, he was very afraid of ghosts, and had come to the conclusion that Trinidad was a place more than usually haunted by unsettled spirits. He told us that if he were left alone on shore for the night, his only course would be to light a ring of fires and sit in the middle with a tight bandage round his head, keeping awake till dawn. If he failed to take these precautions, he would most certainly be torn to pieces or otherwise seriously damaged by the spirits. We took compassion on him and did not leave him to face the terrors of the darkness alone. In the afternoon, the whaleboat returned to the bay and Pollock swam on shore to remain with him. A description of what happened for the next few days would be merely a repetition of what has gone before. The yacht was hove to at night and sailed about the mouth of the bay all day. The surf was always breaking dangerously on the sands, 
so that it was impossible to beach the boat and the men had to swim to and fro from the whaleboat to shore or haul themselves along a line which we had rigged up for the purpose and which was carried from a rock on shore to a buoy moored with the ship's kedge outside the breakers we used also to haul the provisions on shore with a line having lashed them to bamboo rafts which we had constructed for this purpose the weather became so unsettled and the surf was so invariably high that after a few days we came to the conclusion that the sooner we left the island the better and we decided to take the first favorable opportunity for bringing off our property from the shore the bad season was approaching if it had not already commenced and if we waited much longer we might find it impossible for months at a time to carry off stores or men the yacht only remained hove to for eleven days after the shore party had first boarded us and during that time the men with me on the vessels were employed in setting up the rigging rattling down the shrouds and effecting all necessary repairs there was nearly always a high swell running now which was especially uncomfortable when there was no wind for then we would often roll scuppers under for nearly a week it was quite impossible to beach the boat and all communication with the shore had to be effected in the way i have described above at last on february thirteenth luckily for us it was exceptionally calm in southwest bay so that it would be very easy to carry off our stores such a chance was not to be lost in the morning all hands went off in the boats with the exception of myself and wright who stayed on board to work the vessel a landing was effected without any difficulty and the boats returned with heavy loads bringing off the hydraulic jack the guns the bedding and other articles i of course wished to see what work had been done before giving my final decision as to the continuance or abandonment of our exploration not that there was any doubt as to what that decision would be after i had heard the doctor's report in the afternoon i went off in the whaleboat and landed on the island for the first time for forty-eight days leaving the doctor in charge of the yacht while she lay hove to outside the bay i had not put foot on shore here for so long that i was astonished by the aspect of the ravine which had been completely changed in my absence by the labors of my comrades I stood and contemplated the melancholy scene, the great trenches, the piled-up mounds of earth, the uprooted rocks with broken wheelbarrows and blocks, worn-out tools and other relics of our three months' work strewed over the ground, and it was sad to think that all the energy of these men had been spent in vain. They well deserved to succeed, and all the more so because they bore their disappointment with such philosophic cheeriness. It was, obviously, quite useless to persevere any further in this vain search, especially as the difficulties of landing had so increased of late that our operations could only be conducted at great risk to life. So the fiat went forth. The expedition was to be abandoned. We were to clear out of Trinidad bag and baggage as quickly as we could. We returned to the yacht with a good load of stores, the condensing apparatus, and the faithful jackal. After dinner, we sailed round to the cascade and hove to off it. I remained on board with Wright while all the other hands went off in the boats and obtained six casks of water to replenish the ship's now nearly empty tanks. This was altogether a most satisfactory day's work, and we were very well pleased with ourselves when we hove to at sunset and drifted out to the ocean for our well-deserved night's rest. On the following morning, Friday 14th, we tacked to the north of Southwest Bay and found that, though there was more surf than on the previous day, landing was feasible. The boat went off under the doctor's charge, and the tents and all the remaining stores were brought safely on board. Nothing of any value was left. We not only carried off our own tools, but also the picks that had been used by Mr. A.'s expedition. Only broken wheelbarrows and such like useless articles remained in the ravine. From the vessel, the only sign of our late camp that could be seen was Powell's disabled armchair, which he had left standing, a melancholy object on the top of the beach. We stowed the heavier tools and stores under the saloon floor and then sailed again to the cascade. 
the whale boat went off to the pier and a quantity of water was brought on board so that we had a sufficient supply but not much to spare for the voyage now contemplated when the watering party returned we had done with trinidad so both boats were hoisted on deck and a melancholy ceremony was performed our very ancient dinghy which was too rotten to bear any further patching and was not worth the room she used to take up on deck was broken up and handed over to the cook as firewood a tot of rum was served out to each hand we bade farewell to trinidad the foresail was allowed to draw and we sailed away it had long since been decided that whether the treasure was discovered or not we should sail from our desert island to its wealthy namesake trinidad in the west indies a very different sort of place the distance between the two trinidads is roughly two thousand nine hundred miles but we knew that the voyage before us was not likely to be a lengthy one for everything is in favor of a vessel bound the way we were going in the first place it was very unlikely that we should encounter headwinds between our islet and cape st roque and from that point we should most probably have the wind right aft for the rest of the way as the trade winds blow regularly along the coasts of north brazil and the guineas in the next place by sailing at a certain distance from the land we could keep our vessel in the full strength of the south equatorial current which runs at the rate of two or three miles an hour in the direction of our course we had it is true to cross the line once more with its belt of the doldrums but we knew that we should not be much delayed by these tedious equatorial calms as they do not prevail on the coast of brazil to anything like the extent they do in the mid-atlantic besides which the favorable current would be carrying us along with it across the belt and enable us to travel fifty miles or so in a day even in a flat calm this kindly current would indeed carry us straight to our port for it sweeps through the gulf of pariah as well as by the east side of trinidad and as every schoolboy knows in these enlightened days, thence flows round the Caribbean Sea and ultimately emerges from it under another and better known title, the Gulf Stream. With the old Falcon, I had sailed over a portion of this route, accomplishing the voyage from Pernambuco to Georgetown, Demerara, a distance of about 2,000 miles in 10 days, thus keeping up an average of 200 miles a day. At this rate, the alert ought to get to Trinidad in 15 days, but we were not fated to have such luck as that. End of chapter 21。Chapter 22 of The Cruise of the Alert in Search of Treasure by E. F. Knight. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 22 Homeward Bound. We had bidden farewell to the wild spot that had been our home for three months, but we did not lose sight of Trinidad for upwards of thirty hours. We had got under way at sunset on February 14th. A slight drop from the hills carried us a mile or so outside the North Point when we were becalmed and made no progress at all for many hours, and when at last the northeast breeze sprang up, it was so very light that at eight on the following morning, the island was not more than twelve miles astern of us. Throughout the day, calms and light airs succeeded each other, and at sunset the high peaks were still visible. The same weather continued during our second night at sea, and at daybreak on February 16th, we could just distinguish one faint blue mountain summit behind us, the rest of the islet being below the horizon. But the wind now freshened, and all signs of the land soon disappeared, and once again there was nothing to be seen round us but ocean. It was evident that we were not to be favored with the smart voyage I had anticipated. We had fair winds, it is true, and a fair current, but it was rare that we had fresh breezes, while long spells of calm were frequent, so that we did not double Cape St. Roque until February 22nd. Our best day's run up to this point was on the 19th, when we made 182 miles in 24 hours. Nothing much to boast of, seeing that the difference between our distance, according to our dead reckoning, and that calculated by observation of the sun, 
showed that we had a two-knot current under us all the while. At 9 a.m. on February 22nd, having passed between Cape St. Roque and the Rocas Islands, not sighting either, we altered our course from north by east to northwest so as to sail parallel to the mainland at a distance of about 120 miles from it, and thus benefit by the full strength of the current. Having doubled the cape, we encountered, as we had expected, southeast wind, and were thus able to set our spinnaker. As we approached the equator, we experienced the usual unpleasant weather of this region. The sky was almost always overcast, the calms were only broken by heavy squalls, and no night passed without vivid lightning. But, so far, there was little rain. It was very close in our cabins, and even on deck the men were languid with the oppressive, muggy heat. We crossed the line on February 26th. We now had a few days of drifting over a calm sea under a soft, drizzling rain, and we were unable to take any sights of the sun. On March 1st, the wind veered round to the north for a change, so that we were close-hauled on the starboard tack. This wind, being in the opposite direction to the regular trades, was caused by some local disturbance and only lasted for twelve hours. This was our sixteenth day out, and we were still nearly 1,200 miles from our destination, which we might have made by this time had our luck been good. If we only progressed at this rate, our water could not hold out to Trinidad, and though this was no cause for anxiety, as we could easily sail for one of the ports on the mainland, Cayenne or Suriname, for instance, I was particularly anxious not to call anywhere on the way. So the order was given that all hands should be put on rations of water. Our usual rule was to allow the men to use as much water as they pleased without waste, though all washing had, of course, to be done with salt water. This order brought us luck for not an hour after it had been given, the whole sky was covered over with one vast cloud, so dense that, though it was midday, it became dark on the ocean as when dusk is deepening into night. Then it began to rain. Hitherto there had been only drizzle or short showers, which did not afford an opportunity for collecting water. But now it was very different. It poured steadily down as only it can in the tropics, so that by merely collecting the water in the hollow of the whaleboat cover, we soon filled up every tank and breaker on board, and had a sufficient supply to have lasted us to Southampton, had we been bound there. The order as to rations was at once countermanded, and even washing with fresh water was permitted on this extravagant day. Delighted as we had been to get all this water, we soon wearied of such excessively unpleasant weather, for not only did it rain in torrents, but every now and again a violent squall would sweep over the sea, so that scandalize the mainsail and down foresail was a frequent order. It looks like breakers ahead, sir, sang out Ted in the afternoon, and we quite suddenly entered into a tract of very disturbed water. The swell was unaccountably high, and the seas were curling over each other and breaking all around us, just as if we were in a tide race or overfall. The water, too, which up till now had been the usual dark, deep ocean tint, became yellowish-brown, and when a bucket of it was brought up on deck, it was found to be full of a fine powder, like the seed of some grass. As we had not been able to take any sights for some days, I thought we might be somewhat nearer the shoals on the coast than I suppose, so hove to and took soundings, but found no bottom. On tasting the water, it was quite salty, so that these phenomena could scarcely have been caused by the violent stream of the Amazon, which often makes itself felt and sweetens the water far out to sea. It is possible that all this commotion was produced by some volcanic eruption at the bottom of the ocean far beneath us, not an uncommon event in this portion of the South Atlantic. As we sailed through this confused water, we found that the vessel steered wildly, as if eddies and contrary currents were driving her first in one direction and then another, while the tops of the steep waves kept tumbling down upon our decks, compelling us to keep all skylights closed. This made still more objectionable the atmosphere of our already unpleasantly reeking cabins, where the wet clothes, which we had no means of drying, had been accumulating for days. 
the oppressive closeness of this equatorial climate is spoken up with horror even by those who go to sea on big ships but it is far worse on a little fore and after another peculiarity of this tract of broken water out of which we soon emerged as quickly as we had got into it was that it swarmed with fish and other forms of life shoals of small fish were dashing about merrily in the spray while fleets of large pink portuguese men-of-war as the sailors called the nautilus were floating on the surface until we had got into this curious portion of the ocean we had seen very few fish after some days of similar uncomfortable weather we drifted or sailed when the squalls allowed into a respectable climate again and ran before the trade winds at a fair pace our best day's run was on march sixth when we made a hundred and ninety two miles on this day we got into soundings the color of the deep ocean changing to the dark green of comparatively shallow water for we were nearing the coast so as to make the entrance of the gulf of pariah we sighted the mountains of trinidad right ahead of us at daybreak of march eighth about two leagues distant we ran before a light wind between galeota point and baja point the sun now blazed down out of a cloudless sky the morning mists lifted and disclosed the scenery around us which was of a very different nature from that we had left on the desert trinidad we were no longer tumbling about on the great transparent green rollers that perpetually break upon the coasts of our treasure island but sailing on the smooth muddy water of a shallow inland sea on our left were the low shores of venezuela a long line of dreary mangrove swamps that form the delta of the orinoco the peculiar and i should say somewhat malarious odor of the steaming mud being plainly perceptible for leagues out to sea on our right were the shores of trinidad one of the fairest islands of the caribbean sea the sandy beaches were fringed with coconut palms and behind rose gently swelling mountains covered with fine forests the lordly palmistes towering above all the lesser foliage forests in which the trees were of various forms and tints presenting a beautiful appearance the feathery bamboos and the scarlet and purple blossoms of bougainvillea and other flowering trees relieving the dark green slopes of the dense vegetation on the plains that lay under the mountains and in the broad valleys that clothed them could be seen the pale green spreads of the sugar-cane plantations with the tall chimneys of boiling houses rising above them and the darker clumps of the cacao groves when we were near point icacos we saw a school of whales but not having the whaleboat or gun ready we did not go in chase we passed through the narrow serpent's mouth and were inside the gulf of pariah from here we coasted along the shores of trinidad by many a landmark familiar to myself and still more so to our two colored men who became quite excited when they once more beheld their native islands after an absence of two years and more we sailed by cedros point by the curious row of rocks that are known as the serpent's teeth by the village of brea off which several vessels were lying at anchor loading with the bitumen that is dug out of the famous pitch lake about a mile inshore we did not reach port of spain this day for the wind fell away and we had to come to an anchor off st fernando for the night but on the following day march ninth we completed our voyage and let go our anchor off port of spain early in the afternoon having been twenty-two days out from our desert island we were anchored at about two-thirds of a mile from the jetty and there was only eight feet of water under us at low tide as the draught of the alert is ten feet she then sank two feet into the mud this is quite the proper way to do things at port of spain sailing vessels bound here with timber are in the habit of running as high up as they can into the mud knowing that when they have discharged their cargo they will easily float off again the mud deposited in the gulf of pariah by the outflow of the orinoco and its tributaries is the softest possible and is very deep so that a vessel can suffer no injury by lying in it even when the sea is rough so shallow is the water in this roadstead that at a mile and a half from the shore the depth is only three fathoms while a ship's boat cannot approach the end of the jetty at low water i had visited trinidad before 
and had many friends here, so was at once at home on shore, as too were very soon my companions. We were made honorary members of the pleasant Port of Spain Club, and were treated everywhere with that hearty hospitality for which the West Indies have always been noted. Our voyage was now over, and though most of my companions were anxious to sail away with me in search of any other treasure we might hear of on the West Indian quays, or to turn our vessel's head southward again and make for Demerara to travel inland to the gold districts of the Upper Guinea on the Venezuelan frontier, or, in short, set sail for any part of the world that promised adventure and possible profit, I believe they would have turned filibusters if the chance had presented itself. And, though I had four paid hands on board also willing to have gone anywhere we should choose to lead them, still, I could not see my way to extending the voyage any further for the present, and decided to lay up the alert at Port of Spain. It was with reluctance that I made up my mind to do this, for the men we did not want had been weeded out, and I had around me a compact crew of seven, tested and trained by their seven months' travels and hardships, and I also had the right vessel for any adventure. I had several reasons for laying up the yacht in the West Indies instead of sailing her home. I had no use for her in England, and should I undertake another voyage similar to the last, Port of Spain would be a most convenient place to start from. Besides, stores are cheap there, and an excellent colored crew, well adapted for work in the unhealthy tropics, can be readily procured. Moreover, if I decided to sell the yacht, I was certain to get a better price for her in the West Indies or on the Spanish Main, where there is a demand for this sort of craft, than at home, where the market is glutted with second-hand yachts. Before leaving Trinidad, that cosmopolitan island of Britons, Frenchmen, Spaniards, East Indiamen, Chinamen, and Negroes, we undertook several pleasant little voyages with a yacht in the neighborhood of Port of Spain, taking with us several friends from the shore. One of these voyages took place in the Easter holidays, which are properly observed on this island. We had a merry party on board and visited several of the beautiful bays on the islands that divide the Bocas, or northern entrances, to the Gulf of Paria. Our crew had by that time been reduced to myself, Mr. Purcell, and John Wright, for my companions took opportunities of returning home as they occurred. When the old vessel was dismantled and laid up, we last remaining three took passage on the Royal Mail Steamer D, which being an extra cargo boat, was bound on a sort of roving commission round the West Indies in search of bags of cacao to complete her cargo. This was a most enjoyable voyage, thanks to the officers of the D. Purcell and myself were the only passengers. We visited several of the Windward Islands, old friends of mine, most of them, before sailing across the Atlantic to Havre and thence to London docks. Thus ended our treasure hunting expedition. A vain search, but, as I have already said, my companions bore the disappointment well. It was amusing to hear them argue, like the grape-loving fox in the fable, but in a more good-natured way, that we were far better off without the treasure. I remember one favorite argument to this effect. It had been decided that, if the treasure was found, we should not return to England in the yacht, but insure our wealth and go home in the biggest mail steamer we could find. This was our great difficulty, how to find a suitable vessel. As we were now, we cared not much what sort of a craft we sailed in, but once wealthy, how terribly valuable would our lives become. In anticipation even of it, we became nervous. Would any vessel be large and safe enough for us, then that we were millionaires? Well, indeed it was for us that we had not found the pirate's gold for we seemed happy enough as we were, and if possessed of this hoard, our lives would of a certainty have become a burden to us. We should be too precious to be comfortable. We should degenerate into miserable, fearsome hypochondriacs, careful of our means of transit, dreadfully anxious about what we ate or drank, miserably cautious about everything. Better far, no doubt, exclaimed these cheerful philosophers, to remain the careless, happy paupers that we are. Do you still believe in the existence of the treasure? 
That's a question that has been often put to me since my return. Knowing all I do, I have very little doubt that the story of the Russian Finn is substantially true, that the treasures of Lima were hidden on Trinidad. But whether they have been taken away or whether they are still there and we fail to find them because we were not in possession of one link in the directions, I am unable to say. The End End of Chapter 22 End of The Cruise of the Alert in Search of Treasure by E. F. Knight